Ladies and gentlemen, help me give Dr. Rabowski a warm North Carolina New Schools Project welcome. Dr. Rabowski. Thank you very much, Harold. I had the privilege of being at the White House a few weeks ago with a handful of college presidents, and um, I took note of the fact that you had two from, you were the only state that had two there. You had Harold Martin and my friend Holden Thorpe there. And I, I want to say this about your state. You, you are admired by many, far more than you may realize, particularly because of the strength of what you've done in K through 12 and in higher education. Every state has its problems, and yet you've got some luminaries here. And, and Harold Martin is one of the few African-American PhDs in engineering in the country. It's only maybe one person. Give him a big hand. He is a real leader. <laughs> and I would argue that you have the kinds of leaders here in the business community and higher education to be a model for the country. I have had long ties to the state. Years ago, my predecessor from UMBC became the head of Chapel Hill. Uh, and Michael Hooker had me here a lot with him during that period. And Molly Broad and I have always been very close. And I've had a strong relationship with Duke and with Dick Broadhead for a long time, just because of the numbers of students we send to those institutions, Chapel Hill and, and to Duke. Interestingly, I've gotten some great kids from a and and some other places who've gone on to get PhDs from my place. And we get some amazingly well-prepared students from a range of high schools here, from the School for uh, Math and Science, all the way over to some wonderful institutions in rural areas. And I'm always teasing kids when sometimes they will tell me where they're from in North Carolina. And we've got a number of students. And I'll say, and they'll say the name, they'll say, I'm near so-and-so, a bigger city. And I'll say, son, what, what's the name of the town? And they'll tell me. And I said, boy, you're from the country. And they <laughs> But since I grew up really in the country in the summers and my wife is from the country, I like people who are from the country. It tends to be that they've got stronger values, I find, a kind of old-fashioned approach. And so I come today to talk for about a half an hour on where we are as a country as I've gone around the nation looking at education and as I travel to other countries looking at what they do. Now, I come from a campus that has the, the advantage of having students from 150 other countries. And the kids from the other countries tend to be far more accustomed to working hard than American kids, even serious American kids. Uh, and interestingly, when I asked the freshman class how many of them are accustomed to working at least four hours per night, studying at least four hours per night, many people laugh. Now, some of the kids from other countries, whether it's China or Russia, will laugh because that's considered a small number of hours. But our kids are looking at me like, what are you talking about? And when I say, how many of you are accustomed to waiting until the night before the test to study? The American kids, it's an American phenomenon. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. I tell them at that point, by midterm, nobody laughs, I assure you. And the other point of that, that that's so important is that it seems to me that those of us who have succeeded, people here, have a sense of what it takes to make it. And it is our responsibility in every community, in every state, to have people from the business community, to have people from the foundation world, to have people from the schools, and to have families understanding what it will take to give our students support. You know, I will, I will be using stories. Baltimore is what I call the Upper South. One day we are Philadelphia, the next day we're Richmond, all right? But I grew up in the Deep South, Birmingham. You all somewhere in between. Uh, but, but Birmingham is the Deep South, and if I gave you a, a theory all of you may forget it, but if I give you a story, you'll remember it. And I tell stories all the time. Now, you are, New Schools Project is, is a major phenomenon in our country right now as we think about ways of transforming education and the, the kinds of principles you've developed. I've been talking to your staff, the idea that students should be getting ready, all students can get ready to go to college. And I want to talk about this distinction between two year and four years since half of America's students now starts got in two year institutions. Uh, I want to talk about what can we have as vis a vision for our students. We talk about the importance of this and these principles of powerful teaching. How many of you know that a lot of kids are bored in school? Raise your hands. 
We know that, that we've got to find ways of engaging the kids. I love the fact that, that this project talks about reading and writing and thinking and talking in every class. I want to add to that and computing in every class and talking about computing. Give me a hand for mathematics, please, for mathematics. And that we need to think about ways of even greater collaboration across teachers, across disciplines. I had the privilege some years ago of chairing the Math and Science Commission in my state, and what was very clear was that teachers in K through eight are afraid of math. If you look at the courses that we teach in colleges for um, math for elementary school teachers, those courses are not about the, the substance of math, they are about methodology. And as a result of that, understandably, unless a person was very, very excited about math in high school and did well, at least in pre-calculus, if not calculus, that person has not gotten a math background that will make her comfortable with middle school math, for example. And I would argue, having taught math for 40 years, that anyone who is going to teach algebra needs to have a solid grounding at, in, at the very least pre-calculus, if not at least a, a, a calculus course. Because to, to teach one level, you must know something much above it in order to put it in context. And so here is my first story. My mother grew up in a little country town outside of Montgomery called Wetumpka. And every day, and I've told this story so many, for so many uh, years. Um, by the way, give Isaac another hand for being so smart. Would you give Isaac another hand? I thought about this story because I was watching his mama as her heart was beating and she was trying to make sure he was okay and he was doing just fine. His, his, his ability to read and to look up and to connect and to his timing, they worked on that speech. You can believe that. They believe that. They worked on, they really did with his teachers and other people. And, and I was embarrassed to tell this story because my mother had told it to me as a kid because she wanted me to understand her own roots and her background because they are mine. And she said beginning at age 12, every day she had to make a decision for a while about what she was going to do. She could either work in a hot cotton field or she could go and work in a wealthy home. And she decided she wanted to see how rich white people lived, quite frankly. And she didn't want to be out in that hot sun. And um, the woman was very kind to her and said, Maggie, when you finish your work, you can go into the library and read. And mother would do just that. And the woman said, Maggie, take the book home, bring it back when you finish. And all of a sudden, my mother's friends became very upset with her. Because they said, they would say, Maggie, come on outside and play. And she'd say, no, I want to keep reading. And they would ask, why would you want to keep your nose in that book? And it was at that point she began to see this growing difference between herself and her girlfriends. And here was the difference. Mother said, the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And the more she enjoyed reading, the more reading she did. Besides, it allowed her to forget that she was a poor little girl and to dream about the possibilities. In contrast, her girlfriends only read when they had to. And therefore, she would watch their faces frowning because they didn't like it. And finally, they'd push the book aside saying, that's not interesting. Well, obviously, if something, if you don't do it well, it's not going to be interesting. So they never got into the habit of reading. At that point, mother knew exactly what she wanted to do for the rest of her life to become a teacher, an English teacher. She loved literature. People were telling her as a result, and you'll appreciate this in new projects, the idea that she could use language, that she could quote poetry, that she could write well and think well and speak with confidence. And she said, that's what I want to do. I want to teach children to really love language. And she did just that for decades. One of her favorite authors that, thank you. You know, I have to tell you, she always would say, Freema, don't you ever forget that there's no profession more noble than teaching. We teach them all. And when many of us grew up, our society in so many ways showed teachers how important they were to us. I think we are working to get back to that and I think the business communities being here today has everything to do with their understanding of how important teachers are. One of mother's favorite authors, where are my English teachers in the room? Raise your hands, let me see. Oh, we're gonna have a good time today. Yeah, my mother always wanted me to be an English teacher, so I rebelled and I went the math world, right? <laughs> but but, one of my, but my, te my students say I'm a frustrated English teacher. I, I do a lot with literature. One of my mother's favorite authors was Zora Neale Hurston. 
in their book, their eyes were watching God. And when she would be quoting and washing dishes, we'd be working out, Mama, why are you doing that? Now I, I, it's all in my head. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation. His dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men and women. Goosebumps, poetry. So William Carlos Williams said that it's difficult to find news in poetry and, and language of that kind, and yet men die miserably every day because of a lack of what's found there. Her point, Hurston's point, my mother's point was this. You have two groups of people in our society, in humankind. You have people who reach the dreams. Everyone in here has had some dreams fulfilled. And then you have people who, in the words of Langston Hughes, see their dreams forever deferred. It occurs to me that the reason we're here today is that we understand that the only way to help young people to have dreams and to reach the dreams is education. If we could know that we could help every child to want to be smart, and if we could help every child to read as well as Isaac reads, and, and to have every child with somebody that gives support, like his mother, as his mother has done, and as teachers have done in his school, and if we could have many more of them starting to understand and appreciate math, we'd really have a powerful message to give to everyone. And I think it was Bob, the, the new chair, said something that was more profound than most people realize. He said, this business is complicated. Where's Bob? He's here somewhere. Complex. Give him a hand for appreciating the complexity of education. It is a, it's a very important. You see, because usually, let me just say this, because I've got so many business friends. They'll go into a school for a day, and they'll say, oh, this is not bad, and they'll give you the answer of what you need to do. Because, see, everybody went to school, so everybody has the answer of what needs to work. Now, if we were in neurosurgery, nobody would try to tell us how to do our jobs, right? <laughs> but everybody went to school. So if you just did this frame, and everything would be okay, right? But it takes a man of wisdom, a person of wisdom, to appreciate I'm still trying to understand this thing. You know, and the reason education is so complicated is that every child is different. Even in the same family, I have two books uh, that my colleagues and I wrote, one on raising smart black boys, one on raising smart black girls, in science. And what we learned, and the lessons are generalizable to children for the most part, 80%, but the point of the books is that any family, any parent or parents will have to look at the specific challenges and strengths of every child. What works for one within the same family may not work for the next. Am I right? And you may have done a great job and thinking, okay, I got it together. With the first kid and the second kid, you do the same thing, and it just doesn't happen. It happens all the time. You know, uh, my son, you know, it's interesting. I, my mother taught me in the eighth grade when she had become an English teacher and, and, um, and she, was, she was with this language specialist. And then something came out called the new math. How many of you remember the new math? New math did not work as well because we in universities tended to go to, to K through 12 and say, we'll tell you what to do. What we didn't understand in universities is we should be partners with K through 12, not simply trying to tell them what to do because you are the experts on the children and we need to work together to understand what you go through, whether it's about disciplinary issues or behavioral issues or psychological challenges compared to what we do in universities. If there's a partnership, much more can be done. What happened was we went out telling people about set theory and we scared people even more. We frightened them even more. Now watch this. How many of you in this room love to read? Raise your hands. It's an American value, right? Now the fact is all of you can read. Half of you love to read. Some of you read the sports page, all right? <laughs> Others may read novels. How many now, I, want, this is, I know North Carolina is a state that's heavily faith-based. I know this. Whether you say it or not, I know you are. I know you're going to tell me the truth when I ask you this question, right? I'm looking in your faces to see if you're telling me the truth now, all right? This is what a teacher does. They look, the person looks. That's why I want the lights up. I want to see your faces. Here is my question. How many of you love mathematics? Let me see your hands. This is a pretty nerdy group. This isn't bad, right? I've, normally, I get about 20% of the people saying, yeah. And what's interesting is usually a, a mother will come up to me afterwards and say, Dr. Bowski, how could you put math and love in the same sentence? 